My name is Paul McNeil. I coordinate the Close Community Coalition, which is the Coalition of Log Metal Organizing Substance Education. Uh, one thing that we do uh, with our federal funding from the CDC and the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration is we support parent engagement, parent education events like this. And Chris came to me like almost a year ago with the idea of, hey, I want to do this sort of uh, emotional strengths and awareness and emotional skills 101 sort of class for parents someday. And I was like, let's do it. So she came up with this great presentation. She's a certified life coach. She's a longtime close board member, almost half the life of our grant, which is just incredible. She's so supportive of our work. Her kids are amazing. She's got Ruby in college at NYU in China. She's got C Connor. Cooper. Duh! She's got, <laughs> she's got Cooper, who might even get into a college soon. He's a senior here at LHS. And then, of course, there's Rocky, who's like, what, 14 going on 40? 12 going on 20, yeah. Uh, and Rocky's at what school? Williams. Williams, okay. So all those people at home, Rocky's at Williams. And we're recording this too. Um, so bizarre that, why would I do that? Um, so uh, we love Chris Rich. He's such a wonderful parent and, and participant and supporter of our work and a board member. And so uh, I'm so proud to introduce Chris Rich to us all tonight for our Emotions 101 seminar. I am super excited to be here with you guys, and thank you for your kind introduction, Paul. This feels so far away. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so, as Paul was saying, so those three, thi three things that are super important to me, my kids that he just introduced, and um, being on the close board, just I'm passionate about keeping my kids safe with drugs and alcohol and educating them, and I love to be able to share that with the community as well. And um, as a life coach, so I'm combining my three, those three hats tonight with this presentation. But um, so with that, first off, so I'm a certified life coach and a lot of people are like, what even is a life coach? And how is that different from a therapist or a counselor? So a therapist or a counselor, the people that they work with generally are trying to, they might be dealing with mental health issues or trauma or um, they're going through a really hard spot in their life and they're trying to get up to base level. And a life coach, I take someone that has either working with those people, all, those professionals already, so they're at base level and they're trying to go to the next level or someone that's just already functioning at base level and they want to go to the next level. So a lot of the things that I work with my, with my clients, we talk a lot about relationships, goal setting, it could be weight loss, how to, to improve, maybe you're having a difficult relationship with your mother-in-law or that difficult person, it's just like helping people to, they have an area in their life that they wanna improve. So that's what a life coach does. So um, yeah, so, and as far as our agenda for tonight, we are going to talk all about emotions. We're going to talk about, and you can't even see this. I can hardly <laughs> see this. Trust me what this says. Um, so we're going to talk about um, where they come from, what do we do with them or don't do with our emotions, why they matter, wh and why, sh who cares? Why should we care about our emotions? Um, and I'm hoping that this, I want you guys to know that this is a safe space to ask questions and to, there's no judgment. If there's something that you're wondering about, feel free to ask and we're, I know almost everyone in this room and I know that, that you can ask questions here. So we are friends. Um, and also I'm hoping that it'll be interactive. So I'm going to ask you guys questions and I want you to feel like you can ask me questions. And, um, and then at the end, we will, if you are interested in working with me further, I'll give you that information, although most of you have me and your phone number and you know where I live. <laughs> um, and, um, and then we'll have, Paul mentioned that we're gonna have refreshments with that. So, so let's get started, Emotions 101. Um, so the very first thing I wanna talk about is where do our emotions even come from? And I want you to think about like, just right off, where, what is, how would you answer that question? Keep you safe. Okay, promotions there to keep us safe. 
Okay. Your heart. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say your tummy. Your oh, tummy? Okay. You might feel it in your heart or your tummy? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this kind of blows my mind. So I've got, I've got four different examples here for you. So let's pretend that you look out the window and it is pouring rain, like big rain. You look out the window and I've got three, three different examples. So Billy looks out the window and he sees the rain and he says, yes, and he's so excited about it. Okay, Bob looks out the window and he has these sweet little tears of gratitude going down his face. And Sally looks out the window and see, they're all seeing the same rain, but Sally looks out the window and she's sobbing. And these aren't sweet tears of gratitude. She is devastated. So all three people are experiencing the rain, but they all feel very differently about it. So I'm gonna give you a little more information. So Billy, his parent, he's 12 and his parents make him play soccer. <laughs> And there's a tournament today and it just got rained out. So he's like, yes, I don't have to go to the tournament. So he's thrilled about the rain. Bob, he is a farmer out West and he works so hard to keep his crops watered. So he's been praying and he just keeps thinking, I just wish it would rain. So all of a sudden he sees this rain and he feels grateful. And um, Sally is devastated because she's getting married today and it's an outdoor venue. So she feels like her life is ruined because of this rain. So that's our first example. Second example, traffic. And I want you guys to pretend that you're in the car. You're in one of these cars. Pick your favorite car. Uh, Kathy Moreno, yes. if you were in traffic, mm -hmm. tell me what emotion you would feel. It would depend. Mm -hmm. If I'm in no rush, you like, Oh boy, this has happened quite a bit. But like if I'm with Johnny, he'd be flipping out. And I'd be like, breathe, just breathe. <laughs> We're in no rush. But if I'm if I'm in a rush, I'm like boiling over. Okay. So it would depend on the situation. Okay. Um Ellen. Hi. Hi. <laughs> what would you be what would you be feeling? Like your initial you see traffic and your initial emotion? Annoyed. Annoyed. Yeah. And okay. I'm thinking, where am I going to go to the bathroom if I need to? That's, what, that's always the second or first thought I have. Where can I? Go? So it could, it could even be panic because you're anxious, thinking. Anxious, yes. Yeah. How am I going to go to the bathroom? Okay. Um, Shelly Warren, what's I, your initial? I hate traffic. Even if I'm not in a rush, I hate traffic. And I'm always thinking, how can I avoid this? And I, I would, I'm thinking about how to reroute myself and get out, get out of it. So you might feel trapped yes or even like curious it could be you might feel curious like yes. I'm gonna figure this out can I get out of this <laughs> okay so we've got and I'm gonna throw out a totally different emotion someone could be sitting in this car in their car and sometimes I feel like this and you think oh thank goodness because <laughs> I just went out to book club and we never have traffic like this in Longmeadow. But, and you're thinking, my husband put my kid, is putting my kids to bed and I can sit here on a podcast. So you might feel, you might love it. It could be amazing. So the traffic is not causing your emotion. Everyone, because if the traffic caused our emotion or the rain, we would all feel exactly the same about it, but we don't. So that's my second example. Okay. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this scene. This is like, this happens at my house. You walk into a room and you see this. What are you, and I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Christine. Christine, yeah. okay. Yeah. Just like, I'm Chris. What do, what do I feel? You see this, yeah, what is the emotion? You see clothes all over the floor. Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I might be just like really curious. What's curious. Going on? Okay, I love it. I might, I might be excited because somebody's trying on some clothes that are different or trying <laughs> something new. I love this. Okay, so curious or, and I don't ever feel curious or excited when I see a mess like this, but I, those are great examples. I love that. Okay, Laura. Chaos. 
Anxiety. Okay. Shut the door. Yes. <laughs> Denial. Shut the door. Yeah. Um, and you know what? I So when I see this, and I've seen this scene many times. I might have even seen it today. <laughs> And my thought, what my feeling is, um, I kind of have to think about this, but my feeling would be um, unappreciated. And because what I'm thinking, I just spent hours washing and drying and folding. Okay, actually the folding might not have happened to like five business days after, <laughs> but you know what I mean. So I spent all this time and you just threw it on the floor? Like, how rude was that? So I might feel unappreciated. So this is fascinating because there are curious and she's excited thinking, yay, they're trying on clothes. I'm not, I'm not very neat. <laughs> it's okay. That's not. <laughs> well, it's just, it's so interesting because if the clothes were to cause our emotion, we would all feel exactly the same way. And I dare say, if I were to ask my child or my children, because I've seen this in all three rooms, um, if I were to ask them, they might feel neutral. Like they walk in and they're just, <laughs> they just walk through it. They don't care. They're not feeling, they're, they're feeling something totally different. Or I, I talked to, I shared this presentation once and one girl said that she was relieved because she's like, oh, there are my jeans right there that I've been looking for. <laughs> so this, the clothes on the floor, they do not make you feel anything until you have a thought about it. And we all have different thoughts. So my thought was, you are not respecting my time and how rude. And your thought is, yay, she's trying on clothes or, or the chaos, the panic. I guess that was you with the traffic. But we all have different, we have a circumstance, something that's happened, and then we think thoughts about that. That, that circumstance triggers thoughts in our brain, and then, though, then our thoughts create our emotions. And I'm gonna show you this one. Dance party, everybody loves a dance party, right? Nope. Nope. <laughs> What's your emotion, Amy Higgins? Well, when I look at them, I see joy and fun. And if I'm doing that with a band in front of me, I can be that carefree. But if you ask me to join into that dance party, I'm going to feel anxious. Okay, so anxious. Mm -hmm. And what are you thinking? What is the thought? So you're there at the party. The dance party doesn't make you feel anxious because Laura's over People there cutting her up. People see me dance and possibly thinking I look stupid that thought makes me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. So, and someone else, who has an opposite emotion? They go to a dance party. Ellen, I bet you're a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am. I, you know, it might take me a little bit, but sure, I'd probably get up there. So what's your emotion? You're at a dance party and you're feeling? I'm feeling like, excited, let's do it in. Okay. Yeah. So her emotion is excitement and her thought is, let's join in. So the dance party doesn't make you feel anything. You have thoughts about it and that's what creates your emotion. How often do your kids come home and they're like, that was the stupidest party. Well, the party isn't stupid. You don't like it because of what you're thinking because you talk to someone else and they love it. So I just, wanna, I just wanted to give you those examples really quick to help you understand our thoughts create our emotions. And this, um, so, our, we, so often we think it's our circumstance or what happened, the rain, the traffic, the clothes on the floor, the dance party, we think that's what's causing our emotion. What our kids said, the test grade that they got, what our husband just did or didn't do, we think that's what makes us angry or happy or whatever. But before, between that circumstance and our feeling or our emotion, I'm going to use those two words interchangeably, is a thought. And that, we all have different thoughts about things, so that's why we have different emotions about things. So anyone have any questions with that so far? Okay.
So circumstance. I'm sorry, Chris. I have. Yeah. So, do, I, do you feel like thoughts are kind of a neutral, um, like a neutral? Like it's not a feeling then. Like if you, it, it, is it an, is your initial reaction to a circumstance? Is that what you think a thought is? Like, because you could change your thoughts too, which would change your feelings, right? So Absolutely. Is it like? Yeah. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I, so, I'm going to say, here, Kathy, go ahead. Like a thought could be based on an experience that you had or something going on in your life, yeah. which creates that thought, which then creates that feeling. Yes, yeah. So, and we're all, we've got thousands. Something happens, and you're going to have a whole bunch of thoughts just pop in, and you probably, you don't even notice, unless you're a life coach, <laughs> you don't notice them. And that, so this is, so yeah, and we all have different experiences. I'm guessing that El the reason why Ellen is worried about a bathroom in traffic, she probably has an experience with that, or something. <laughs> <laughs> or Dude, something. I was in high school and I was tr stuck in traffic at a concert and I couldn't go to the bathroom. She's really. There so you go. it makes me anxious then. So we've all we all have our experiences that are going. So a circumstance, something happens outside of us, or something out of our control. And we're gonna think thoughts about it and they just come up quick, quick, quick. And there might be lots of thoughts about that circumstance, but that our thoughts are what create our feelings. So, okay, and if you don't get anything out of anything else I say tonight, this is gold right here, just understanding <laughs> this. Okay, but I've got lots of other good things. Okay, so the next thing I wanna talk about is the human experience. We've got some myths about the human experience. First of all, we think that life is supposed to be perfect and that we're supposed to feel happy all the time and that we should be, that our life should be free from hardship and trials and all of our friends should be happy and everyone should get into the college they want and all the, we think that life is supposed to be free from all this. And I don't know about you guys, but my life sure isn't like that. And I know most of you pretty darn well, and I know your lives aren't like that. And I'm just going to go on a lamb with Christine. <laughs> I want to tell your secrets. So we, but we have this idea that we're supposed to be happy all the time. And I just want to offer that thinking that we should be happy all the time causes us so much suffering. Or thinking that I shouldn't have this trial or this hardship. Because we all do. And it's, this is one of the biggest causes of suffering, is just thinking that we should be happy all the time. So um, I've got a friend at church that he is an amazing pianist, and I love watching him play the piano. He is, I'm not, I'm not a piano player, but he, it's so fun because he's playing the white keys and the black keys, and some of the notes are super low, and some of them are up high, and some of them are really soft, and some of them are big and loud. And it's, with all that variety, all that contrast and opposition, that's what makes the song beautiful, all the different feeling in the song. And I wanna offer that life is exactly the same way. It's that contrast in life that makes the whole human experience what it is, that it's a, in all of its amazingness. Um, and this is one of my very favorite concepts, the concept of 50-50, the human experience is not one of being happy 100% of the time. 50% of the time, you're gonna have emotions that feel fantastic and wonderful. You're gonna feel happy and proud and excited and you're gonna feel fantastic. And 50% of the time, you're not. You're gonna feel disappointed and embarrassed and betrayed and sad and all those things. And a lot of people are like, well, it's not 50-50. It's not an exact, formula, but I'm just saying like if you were to look at your whole life, it I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say that I bet you're going to, you would be able to see this 50-50 this play out. So if your life is sometimes amazing and fun and sometimes really crappy and hard, I just want to let you know that that is normal. That is the human experience. And I'm not talking about mental illness, like if, if you're struggling with depression or something like that. I highly encourage you to talk to a professional to help you, but the, these ups and downs in life, that is the human experience, and it's supposed to be like that. You're not 
meant to be happy all the time. You wouldn't even get it. If you were happy every single day, you wouldn't know. You'd have nothing to compare it to. Um, okay, this is one of my favorite tools that I use with my clients called the feelings wheel. And I actually have a copy of this for you to take home with you tonight. I love this. Because we think, if I were to ask you, like, tell me your top five emotions that you think of. And just shout them out. What are emotions that you, like, what are the, if you had to give me five, what would you say? What are you? Happy. Happy. Sad. 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 Angry. Angry. <laughs> Confused. Okay, so there's like our quick go-to, happy, sad, angry, maybe anxious or stressed. Frustrated. But we all have this like super limited emotional vocabulary. And it's probably those couple of words that we kind of stick with. But what I want to show you is there's so much more. And this is just like a smattering. I actually have, I've got books with pages four pages of four columns each of emotions that are out there and there's so much on here and i'm guessing you can't really read because i can't read it but um curious stressed insecure mad distant embarrassed horrified um vindicated fragile there are so many emotions it's not just happy and sad and what i want to offer to you that whole range, that is the human experience, my friends. All of them. And it could even be that you felt them all on the same day. <laughs> okay, that might be a little busy, but like this is normal to feel all these different emotions. Um, okay, the next thing, I wanna teach you a couple of things about your brain. And I am not a neuroscientist or a scientist by any means, but just a couple of really simple things. Our brain is motivated by three things. It wants to seek pleasure, it wants to avoid pain, and it wants to be really efficient. And this is, um, if you think about like humans as we've evolved, think of cavemen. They, this really served them well, because seek pleasure, avoid pain, and be efficient. Well, when they're motivated by those things, that's how the species kept going. That's why they had more babies. That's why they um, avoid pain. It keeps you safe. If you're, if, you're, uh, if you're afraid that you're gonna get hurt, you're gonna stay safe. And um, this is all, there's a lot of times where this serves us really well, but there's a lot of times where it doesn't serve us well. And I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about that as we go throughout the presentation. Uh, what is meant by be efficient? To be, a, to stay, your brain wants to just keep doing the same thing that's always done. It doesn't wanna have to, Let's say that I want to exercise, that I have a goal to exercise, and I'm not exercising. My brain is in the habit of not exercising, so if I have, so it's saying like, is exercise pleasurable? Nope. <laughs> is it painful? Yes, it can be. And is it efficient if I've never done this? No, because I'm used to not exercising. So I have to. mean it's like a habit. Yeah. So I have to change your regular groove. Yeah. So I have to change my habit. Or if I'm like, should I go on a walk or should I sit here and watch a movie? Well, I have to go and put my sneakers on and, and get out of my jeans or whatever. So that's not efficient. It feels so much better to sit here where this is pleasurable and it's not painful. So my brain's like, do that. <laughs> Stay on the couch. So does that make sense? Okay, so that's our motiv motivational triad. Seek pleasure, avoid pain, and be efficient. So, um, and that, with the pleasure, I want to talk just a second about dopamine. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter that um, it, that's, it plays a role in how we feel pleasure. Just a super basic definition. So, I, our brains, they memorize things that give us a little hit of dopamine, and then they want us to go do it again. And this, um, so that's, I was just thinking of things that give me, like when I, something that gives me pleasure, I just kind of made a list of th some things like naturally, and you, I hope, can you read that? Mm -hmm. You guys have better eyes than I do. So food, food is, can be something that I get a little hit of dopamine. Exercise, connection, being in nature. I love going on a walk with Amy Higgins. She's one of my bestest friends ever. 
So exercising with a dear friend, being out in nature, my brain's like, this is amazing. I love this because it's pleasurable and it's so that dopamine is being released. Um, good music, physical touch, and that from someone putting their arm around you to all the way, the whole gamut of physical touch. Um, accomplishment, when you accomplish something on your to-do list or you complete it, if you win a game. Um, laughter, that's a great, a great way to release dopamine. Getting something organized, a good story, learning about something that you really enjoy, um, serving others, feeling gratitude, creating something, all those things. And there's, this is just a small, these are just things that I thought of, like things that I enjoy that release, that give me pleasure. And I like to, and I told you I'm not a scientist, but I, this is how I think about this. So I think about dopamine as it, like our brain has this pump. And I just think of a ketchup pump. <laughs> that every time I do something that's pleasurable, there's just like a little psh, and that's released in my brain. And um, so for an example here, if, let's say you eat some raspberries out of the garden. And you're outside with a friend and you eat those raspberries and they taste good and it's, your brain's like psh, a little a little squirt of dopamine and i don't know how it really works this is just how i think of it um so i want you to hang on to dopamine for a second because we're going to come back to it so we don't really we learn so much in school and i think we're getting better i know that they we talk about emotions now that i mean no one ever taught me about emotions and we learn about, you know, how to write a paper and how to get into college and calculus and stuff. And I hate to tell you this, and don't tell my math teacher, I've never used my calculus, ever. <laughs> but no one ever taught me about emotions, and that's something I'm dealing with every single day, all day long, and so are you. So this is so, so, so important. And I want to offer, we've actually been taught to not feel our emotions. I want you to think about that for a second. Can you think of something that maybe your parents said to you or you've just heard socially or even something you've said to your kids? Can you think of a message that's teaching us not to feel emotions? Aim. Well, my nickname by my mother growing up was Sarah Bernhardt, who was a famous actress, and she would say, don't cry, you're being dramatic, Sarah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Right? So. Kind of yeah, that definitely kind of sends a message. Here. Yeah, don't cry. Don't yeah. be dramatic. What else? <laughs> suck it up. I don't know. Suck it up. <laughs> That's a great example, Ellen. Yeah, suck it up. Can you guys think of any other ones? I, I think about the response some people give, like, no, I'm fine. Yeah. You know, I'm fine. Mm hmm. So yeah, it a made lot, yeah. Sorry. A lot of time, like growing up, I don't know if it was more of my background, um, but my dad was always like, "Guys, don't cry. You know, guys don't show emotion. Guys, you know, they're stoic. They keep yeah. it all in." And I made it a point not to do that with my kids. But um, that's a very yeah, very strong message that guys don't cry. That they should be strong. Right. Um, okay, I, I was just thinking of what I've, um, some of the ones I thought of. Your kids come in, they're, I'm so scared, there's a monster under my bed. And we're all like, there's no monster, go to bed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so don't be scared, you're wrong, there's no monster. Um, okay, don't cry, hop up, you're not hurt, come on, you're okay. Fake it till you make it. How often do we hear that or think that? Um, I love this one. What's wrong? Your kid comes home from school and you see that they're not happy. So you're like, what's wrong? Because we think they should be happy all the time. So just that question, what's wrong, implies something's not right here. You are, there's a problem that you should be happy and let's, let's figure this out. And that not, I mean, I'm not saying not, to, I, I want you to be compassionate with it, but just that message of, What's wrong means whatever you're feeling is a problem. Um, don't be nervous. You got this. And like we sometimes we do it out of, you know, like being a cheerleader. But 
it's okay to be nervous. When you have a test, it makes sense that you're nervous. Um, oh, my favorite, when you had a bad day, let's go get ice cream. <laughs> Pardon? Don't put that one on the list. Ah. <laughs> you get ice cream? I still want you to take me for ice cream, babe. Um, Elsa taught us conceal, don't feel. And what someone shared this in my last presentation. Stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. Yeah, do not feel your emotion or I'm gonna or I'm gonna show my emotion. So I think just interesting to take note. Okay, so there are four things that we do with our emotions and I'm going to show you, we're going to talk about each one of these. So the first thing that we do is we, um, we're going to go through each, each one of these. So the first one I want to talk about is avoiding emotions. And I just want to offer that I am a professional at doing all of these. <laughs> and I'm going to just go out on a limb. I bet you are too. Cause we have, we've been taught to avoid our emotions. So I want you to think, what are, what are some possible things that you could do to avoid your emotions? Because some of them, we're going to be honest, they feel terrible. I don't like being humiliated. I don't like being angry. It doesn't feel good. So instead of feeling those, I can, I've got lots of options. So let's throw some out here. Insult people. Okay. I mean, I don't do that. But, but a, a possibility. Use substance. Use substances. Thank you from our drug person. <laughs> Not that she just, that she. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> from our person that helps us to not do drug person. Numb out with food. Numb out with food. Yes, yeah. yeah, so numbing out. So food is a great thing. Drugs, what else? Ooh. How about dismissing? Like when your kid is upset because they just lost a game in sports and we say, don't, it's fine, you'll get the next one. Mm -hmm. Like, don't feel that way. Just think about the next game. Just avoid it. Avoid feeling that way. Yeah. What else? There, we, we are really good at this. So I want you to think, you're really mad. So you go and, you don't want to feel mad. So you go and, what do you do? Watch a movie. Watch a movie. Netflix is amazing for that. Eat. eat. Be alone. Okay, yeah. Throw things away and organize. Get really busy, angry clean. So sleep, lots there, and this is just like, what'd you say? Australia, like Alexander. Yes, and it's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, exactly. Okay, so um, I think you guys listed most of them, but I was, stay busy. I don't want to feel this loneliness or this heartache, so I'm gonna go and throw a party with all my friends, or I'm gonna, go and, and work harder, or I'm going to clean the house, or I'm gonna do something so I don't have to feel it. I'm avoiding it. Um, exercise. I'm so frustrated, so I'm gonna go on a walk. I'm gonna call Amy Higgins and say, Amy! <laughs> I've never done that, have I? Um, read a book. Social media. Oh, if my kids are driving me bonkers, it's amazing to go away and sit on my phone and all of a sudden, they're not driving me bonkers anymore. Um, eat, we said that. Retail therapy. Anyone like that? <laughs> I do. Netflix, watching movies. Alcohol. Um, gambling, drugs, pornography. And I also put over fill in the blank, over anything. If you are... And, um, I want to point out that some of these things, like exercise, I think exercise is a great choice, a great option. So a lot of these things in and of themselves are not a problem, but we want to check in with ourselves. Why am I doing this? Am I doing this because I want to do it because I enjoy it, or am I doing this to avoid my feeling? And um, that we're going to talk about that more in just a minute. So. Okay, remember the raspberries and the dopamine and my little dopamine pump? And how when we ate the raspberries, it was like, Psh. Well, there's some things that I can eat, like this hot fudge sundae with brownies and peanut butter sauce and whipped cream and nuts. When I eat that, that dopamine pump starts going, <laughs> 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 And 
your brain's like, that was amazing. Let's go do more of that. That feels good. So, and that's just like an example, you know, like with food. And we, nothing wrong with a hot fudge sundae. I highly recommend them. But our brains are, is this, is a hot fudge sundae pleasurable? Sure is to me. Um, can I avoid pain with it? Yeah, I don't have to think about my problems until I have a tummy ache after in a minute. And, um, and it being really efficient, I know that if I'm having a bad day and I go to the McDonald's drive-thru, that hot fudge sundae, I'm in that habit of doing that. So, our, so a lot of times we, our brain knows if I do this activity, I can have dopamine released and I'm gonna feel better because I have this idea that I should be happy all the time. So, um, well, I call this a concentrated or a false pleasure. So there are, all, there are a bunch of things that we, our brains, like they know this is gonna make me feel better, but it's not really, remember we talked about those natural pleasures? These are like extreme, lots of dopamine coming out at once. Um, so I just, I have a couple examples up here. So, and I want you to think of your kids. That's all I thought of when you put that up there. That's everything that kids do. <laughs> Why? Because it's, they're so freaking stressed right now that like they just can't deal with, you know, what's happening in the world. So, yeah. They don't know how to handle their emotions. And so this feels better. Is it pleasurable to win? A, so you're playing a video game. Winning. Winning feels awesome. The dopamine's getting pumped out. And you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. So it totally makes sense. And I'm not saying that any of these things are bad. I just, we just want to be aware that if I'm doing it in excess, because I don't want to feel my feelings, that's why I'm avoiding my emotions when I'm doing this. So I'm not saying don't play video games or don't get on your phone or watch a movie. And, and I'm definitely not saying don't sleep. <laughs> but how often do we avoid an emotion by sleeping? In excess, oversleeping. Um, so it, like with, um, I noticed for me, if I'm stressed out at all, I totally go get on Marco Polo or Instagram or something. I, I can't remember where I, I couldn't find the, the actual facts on this, but I, I have a memory, so don't quote me on this. When you're on social media, every, it's like every 17 seconds, more dopamine is released because it's colorful and it's fun. So your brain is like, this is awesome. And it just keeps, it's like a constant rush of dopamine. So we just want to be like, we want to be on to ourselves. Am I doing this because I enjoy it? Because it's great. Nothing wrong with social media. It's, that's can be fun. Or am I doing this because I can't handle the emotions that I have? So um, any questions about any of this? Okay, so um, one, of, one of the things I want to talk about is buffering. If you have, a, let's say you're moving a piano on your hardwood floor and it's going to drag and leave marks in your floor, you're going to put a buffer between the wheel and the hardwood floor, like a towel or some, something to move that piano. We do the same things. We don't want to feel our emotions because they sometimes can feel terrible. So we know what, so we buffer by overeating, over drinking, over Netflix, over shopping, over fill in the blank. And not everything is a buffer. What the, what I, how I determine what a buffer is, is if it has a net negative. So like going on a walk, I think is a great idea if you're stressed out. And I'm, but if I'm doing it at the expense of my family and I'm not connecting with my people, like I'm just exercising, then I've got a problem. Or if I am shopping so much that I'm in debt because I'm buffering with it. Or if I'm overeating, as a buffer, I'm going to gain weight. My clothes aren't going to fit or alcohol or drugs or whatever. So we just want to like be onto ourselves. Am I doing this so I don't have to feel it? And is this a problem for me? I don't think I'm going to walk too much. Well, people do though. 
If I'm just like leaving my family to go exercise, that could be a problem. Uh, I mean all the time. Go on walks. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Um, any questions with buffering? And I, as we're talking about this, I want you to like be super honest with yourself. What are my buffers? What am I doing? How do I avoid my emotions? And just, I want you to be, and not in a way to beat yourself up, but just to be aware, like, is this what I, perhaps what I'm doing? Um, okay, and then when, when we look at other things that are, and I want you to be thinking about our teenagers, they don't want to feel their emotions. So we've got alcohol. That can be a great way to numb out. If you're thinking of that. Seek pleasure, avoid pain, and be efficient. Your brain's like, yeah, because I don't have to feel my emotions if I'm doing that. Or pornography or drugs. So we just want to understand that, that our brains work that way. And our teenagers with underdeveloped brains, their brains are doing the same thing. So we just want to be... We want to be aware of that. Um, so when we're avoiding an emotion, what we're doing is we are looking for an outside solution to take care of an internal problem. Any questions with any of that? Hey, Paul, can I grab a water? I am yeah. so thirsty. Yeah. Or I should say, hey, Paul, would you please bring me a water? <laughs> Why did you ask? Uh, did you ask him politely? You know, I'm, <laughs> Use a strong, use a strong voice. My big girl voice. Mm. Ooh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so that's what. So when we're avoiding our emotions, that's what we're doing. And so I want you to think, like, ask yourself, what do I? How do I avoid my emotions? And I just want you to pay attention when you're, when something comes up tomorrow or tonight. I'm guessing your people could still be irritating when you get home. <laughs> and just like be on to yourself. Oh, I don't want to feel this emotion, so I am avoiding it. And just be, just be on to yourself. Um, okay, the next one is, so door number two with our emotions is to react. So what are some ways that we react? Screaming. Screaming. What did you say? I said like that. Like that, that dude, yeah. Screaming. Crying. Crying. Blaming. Blaming. Yeah. Throwing, hitting. Throwing, hitting. Throwing. Yes, those Running are. Running away. What did you say? Running away. Running away. Um, okay, I think we got most of them. Run, or, um, cry, yell, hit. Slamming doors a little dramatically. Never. No, I've never closed the microwave with more force than I should have. Um, unkind comments that you wouldn't normally say. Um, and on the opposite end of that, I might isolate. I'm mad, so I'm getting away. And um, I might shut down or I might give someone the silent treatment. That could be another way that we react to an emotion. So basically what's going on is I am vomiting my emotions on other people when I'm reacting. Or I go and I beat myself up when I'm reacting to an emotion. Any questions with that? Okay, then the next door, door number three, we can resist our emotions and we're so good at this. We're good at all of them because we're human beings. Um, what could it look like to resist an emotion? Like this kind of intellectualizing, explaining, and um, justifying things. Okay. Yeah. Can you think of other ways that we resist? Ignoring it. Ignoring it. Blaming it on another person. Mm hmm Yep. Any other thoughts? Okay, so pretend. I'm totally fine, and Amy makes fun of me for this. That I have this thing where my eyebrows do not, I can't even explain it, but she's like, I know you're full of it because your eyebrows, <laughs> that I'll just pretend. I am not mad because my eyebrows are right here, 
And my eyes are, am I explaining this accurately? And there's a nice tone in your voice even when you're angry. <laughs> <laughs> she loves to make fun of me for that. And it's so true because I'm resisting my emotion. I'm pretending that everything is fine. Um, or lying about it. Like how often does someone come up to you and you say, are you doing okay? I'm fine. I'm totally fine. So we lie about it. We deny. I'm not mad. Um, I'm not resentful. I'm not whatever your husband just accused you of. And you're like, I'm not that. Well, yeah, you might be. Um, another thing that I'm really good at is layering on a positive thought. Like, Someone just died, but it's going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. So like layering on, and I'm all for positive thoughts, but we just want to like check in with what we're doing. Um, we sweep it under the rug, like Laura was saying. Um, and what's interesting is when we resist our emotions, I think about times where you're like, let's say you're sad and someone's like, are you okay? And you're like, no, I'm fine. And I keep my eyebrows right where they're supposed to be. And then you start kind of tensing up and you're like, don't cry, don't let the tears out. You get a lump in your throat and it's just like, get me out of here fast, I got it. So you literally tense up and you resist what the emotion is. And as we do that, it's like having a beach ball. Have you ever been at the pool? You're pushing the beach ball down. What happens when we push the beach ball down? And it splashes. A big, it comes up when we resist it, it just pops right up. Um, and we um, tense up. So, and I went with our emotions, when we resist them, they persist. And I love this. I'm not mad, I'm not mad, I'm not mad! <laughs> and it just gets bigger and bigger when we're resisting it. Um, and with an emotion like anxiety, that is, anxiety is so common right now among the humans, but especially with our, our, our youth. That is, a, you hear about anxiety all the time. And so it's like, I don't want to be, they start feeling pant, and they, we, I'm going to say, we start feeling anxious about something. It's like, no, I can't be anxious. Not here, not now. I got to get out of here. And you tense up to, and then you get anxious about your anxiety. And that, my friends, is like pouring gasoline on a fire. When we're, so when we're resisting an emotion like that, it can just make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so those are three of our doors. So I want you to imagine what your life could be like if you didn't have to do all those things. You didn't have to hide from your emotions and you could actually feel them. And that's what I want you to, that's the next thing we're going to talk about. And that, my friends, is allowing your emotions. And a lot of times, like, we'll hear people say, you just need to sit with the grief. Or to do, to just let it be. i got to have another drink. All this talking. Allow yourself to drink. Chris. Allow it, yes. That's right. Water. Oh, okay. That is good water, Paul. I don't know how you made it, but it's a big wide spring. I thought you made it. Okay, so allowing our emotions. What does that even look like, and what does that mean? Well, I'm going to give you some tips. Because this, my friends, I can't even tell you how amazing your life can be when we allow our emotions instead of avoiding reacting and resisting our emotions. This is the secret sauce, my friends, right here. And this is, as a life coach, this is what I'm doing with my clients because we've got emotions on all sorts of different, on everything that's going on. And so this is what I do a lot with my clients is helping them to process and allow whatever is coming up for them. And um, so what does it look like to an allow an emotion? Well, the very first thing that is so simple and profoundly powerful is to name the emotion. And that's as simple as saying, I am mad. I am humiliated. I, and, I'm, and I also, instead of saying I am, I like to say I feel. I feel angry. I feel humiliated. So when we do that, and that feelings wheel, 
I'm gonna, you're gonna, and you're gonna walk out with one of those so you can sit there and look at it. I feel whatever. And this is so powerful because so often we're like, nope, I'm gonna go overeat or I'm gonna overdrink or I'm gonna go shopping just to push it away so I don't have to deal with it. But we wanna stop and validate yourself for how you feel. So this can be so powerful. And sometimes that might be all you need to just be like, I feel embarrassed. That can make a big difference. And then I don't have to go eat a whole pint of haagen -Dazs. I can do that if I want to, because I'm choosing that, because I want to do that, but I don't need to, to get away from my emotion. So just name it, validate that that's how you feel. Um, the second thing, so instead of resisting and like, I can't cry, I can't feel this, I want you to open up just to like literally, just open your body and relax into it. And a lot of times when I'm doing this, I'll go and sit in my office or I'll, maybe I'm in the car where I can just stop and I'll do this if I have time to be by myself. But you can do it while you're in a business meeting and someone's so irritating or not, well, they, that's a whole different thing. You think they're irritating you. You feel irritated. <laughs> um, so I can, so I, I just, so I name it and then I relax into it. And a lot of times I'm like, get your shoulders out of your ears, Chris Rich, and just like open up and just let it be there. Take some deep breaths if that helps. Um, okay, the next thing is then you want to go and find it in your body. And I think this is so fascinating. When I first started doing this work, people are like, okay, tell me how, where do you feel anger? And I'm like, what do you mean, where do I feel anger? I'm just angry. <laughs> but to stop and ask yourself, where is the anger in my body? And so what that looks like is you literally do a body scan. Start at the top of your head and go look. So let's say I'm feeling angry and I scan my body. Well, I know I'm angry because my eyebrows are up here, like Amy Higgins told me, or whatever I'm feeling. Um, so I might have some tension in my forehead. I might feel like I'm going to cry. My face might be hot. So I want to see what's going on physically in my body. And, and then I go, I keep moving down. I might, my throat might be tight because I'm about to cry. And then I feel it in my chest. And then like my stomach, you might notice like stuff going on in your stomach. Your hands might be clenched. You just go find it wherever it is in your body. And um, then once we do that, and the next thing we do is, is we find out, oops, come on, oh, there we go. I love this exercise. So I, like to describe, you want to go in and let's say, so it's anger and I feel it in all those places, but I really feel it in my chest. For me, I feel a lot of my emotions in my chest and it looks different for everyone. And I want you to like pay attention to how does an emotion feel? Cause I'm guessing most of you couldn't tell me if you had to like write a paper about it, you'd have to. So I want you to stop and figure out how, what does anger feel like? What does loneliness feel like? So I love this exercise. I like to pretend that I'm explaining that I'm talking to an alien and I'm saying, I am so angry. And he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't feel any emotions. Tell me, what does that feel like? What does that look like? And you're like, you know, really mad. He's like, no, I don't know. Like, tell me what that looks like. So I think of, and this is great with kids. Kids are actually pretty good at this. Um, but their moms, their parents need to know how to do it first. So we want to learn how to do it on ourselves and then we can help our kids with this. So some questions I, that I go and ask, does it have a size? Is it big or is it little? And a lot of times I'll compare my emotion to a piece of fruit or a ball or something that's like a concrete thing. So I'll think like, uh, well, I'm going to show you an example in just a second. So does it have a size? Does it have a color? a temperature, a texture, does it move around or does it stay put? A lot of times people just say like, it's just heavy, heavy in my chest. Um, does it have a smell? Does it have a taste? 
And this sounds, the first time I heard this, I'm like, this is nuts. But then when I started doing it, I was amazed how if we give our emotions some attention and just let them be there, they're like a little, like a, a toddler. They just want to be seen. Like, just validate that this is how you feel and give it some attention. And then you don't need to go and drink the whole bottle of wine or eat the entire bag of potato chips or whatever it is that you're doing to not feel your emotion. Um, so here's an example. So for me, let's say that my emotion is anger. And I, so I, I said, I feel angry. I opened up and relaxed, took some good deep breaths. I found it all the places in my body, but I really notice it in my chest. And it's about as big as a cantaloupe. And I can actually, I can put my hands on my chest and just like feel, okay, I, it's like right here, I feel this. It's about as big as a cantaloupe and I ask those other questions. Does it have a color, size, shape, all that. And it's bright red and it's hot like lava. And it's like oozing through my chest. So I make it like really concrete and so I can like picture what it looks like in my body. And as I do this, it is amazing what happens. I can like check in with myself again and be like, okay, that cantaloupe, it's now a mango. It's still there, but it's like a little bit smaller. And if I keep like just letting it be there, okay, now that mango is a kiwi and it just, it's going to dissipate. So um, what is, so as I allow my emotions, what happens, it's just the opposite of resisting it. Whoops. So I've got a big emotion and if I just let it be there, the human body is designed to process emotions because we all have them. Our bodies, that's, it's part of the human experience. And if I can let myself allow it, then it's going, my body knows what to do with it. And I, okay, and I want you to think about this, like going back to our kids with drugs and alcohol. Just think if they knew how to allow their emotions, how would that be? Like, what if we were able to teach them this and to help them? What, can you imagine what that would be like if they had this tool? Because then you don't need to go get stoned. Or so you don't feel your emotions or to go. And like, I think of how often do you see our kids are, they're so, if they don't have their phones in their hands, <laughs> they're like, I'm lonely. What do I do? They're lost without that little thing. And imagine if they could just like be okay with sitting there and feeling their emotions. This is such a gift that we can give ourselves and we're never, it's never too late to learn how to do this. If we can do this for ourselves and help our kids do this, this is such a gift that can help them. And then we don't have to worry about, there's so many things that we can not have to deal with if we just know how to feel our emotions. Um, any questions about any of this? And I, I want to offer that you're never too old to learn it. Yeah. I do. She may not want to hear it from you. Right, right. My kids, if they like sense any coaching, they're like done. <laughs> they don't want to talk to me about it. But I think I do love like in the schools, I, I feel like they're talking more about emotions and that. I think that's great. 
Um, but it could look like, she, you know, like my daughter calls me and she's saying, I'm so scared. And like, yeah, I bet you're scared. That totally makes sense that you've got this test tomorrow. I would feel scared. And just like having a conversation with them about it that. Like validating their. Yeah. And saying, like, yeah. Yeah. And then like, oh, I totally. Yeah. I remember when I was in college and yeah, I felt really scared too. Yeah. So like validating and helping them to understand modeling life is not life is 50 50 it's not going to be it's okay that you don't feel happy about this right now and just having i think so often we can just we can have adult conversations with our kids about their emotions and like this is a normal part of life and yeah i'm this is really hard so validating that and and just encouraging them to share their emotions and it could be you know like tell me what does that feel like for you? When you're really nervous, tell me what's, what's going on for you. I had, so I had a conversation with Rocky a while ago. I have to be very sneaky because they don't want the coach mom coming out. Mm -hmm. But he was saying, um, I'm so nervous about this. And instead of saying, like, I want to say, don't be nervous. You've studied. It's going to be okay. I said, so when I'm nervous, this is how I feel? Like, what's going on for you? And he, I love this. He said, um, he said, oh, how do you say it? Jitter, jitter, stomach glitter. <laughs> and I was like, that is a beautiful description of, I think of the, you know, those like wands that have the glitter and the, the mm -hmm. fluid. And I was like, do you mean like that? And he's like, yeah, that's what my tummy feels like right now. And so just like having a conversation, they may not sit down and you can give them a lesson, right. but just like, yeah, tell me where, so like when I'm nervous, I feel it. I feel like I have butterflies in my stomach or something. Tell me what, what's it like for you? And just like giving them and asking them questions about it. And they might, I get it that your kids don't want to talk about it. <laughs> But um, just like giving him an opportunity and telling him, yeah, this is how I feel. Or, or I've noticed when I am really stressed, I don't like feeling stressed. So I go get on my phone. What, is there anything that you do when you're like, if you don't want to feel, you don't want to feel bad. So what do you do? And like, just have a conversation with them about it. And just be, I think the be one of the best gifts we can give our kids is being open and honest with them. And, you know, like, yeah, I feel, and modeling that for him, like, I'm so nervous right now, or I keep saying nervous, I'm really angry, and I feel like I've got this volcano in my chest, and it's bright red, and, and you know, like, I mean, maybe you don't say that to your kid, because they're like, <laughs> <laughs> time for me to leave, but just, we have opportunities where we can talk to them about it, and um, just teach them about as we're learning it and just like, Oh, I just learned this cool thing. I didn't realize this, but, and teach them what you learned tonight. Yeah. So Amy Higgins. I'm listening to you, you know, about your approach and, um, and I'm just in my mind thinking that by taking that approach, you're, you're leaving the door open for them. You're not invalidating and you're not assuming you're not, you're not trying to shut down their feelings and say you shouldn't feel that way. And you're not assuming that they should feel a certain way. And it brought me back to like that picture of the dance floor and how you showed so many different, you suggested there's so many different reactions and where like if, if I had a kid in college and I showed them that picture and they said, oh, that makes me anxious. It makes me feel like I'm gonna have a panic attack of not going on a dance floor, going on campus with all those other kids. Well, why would you feel that way? It's the best time of your life, you're in college. Instead of having a response about what I assume you should feel, I could think about that dance floor and go, well, how does that make you feel? And you're, yeah. I'm, it's giving me a little bit of freedom in my head to like, oh, how can I go back and talk to Gabe Higgins about his emotions? And like, oh, I'm going to use some of those. <laughs> yeah, that's a so great. You shut down. A gr being curious with him is such a great, a great thing, to, you know, to ask him. And I think it's so often we assume, I had a friend that she told me she was pregnant. And I was, a, you know, like if that would have been me at her age. <laughs> I would have been like, oh, that's so great. I'm so happy for you. 
but checking in with people like how do you feel about that because they might have like going back to the very beginning of the presentation like i know how i would feel but i don't know how you're gonna feel mm. so yeah asking people checking in how how do you feel about that i think can be a, a good good question can i add something absolutely I have had a lot of experience practicing mindfulness, mm -hmm. and I have found it to be, for me, number one go-to helpful thing for this and for basically for everything, but I haven't been able to access other tools very well, but this thing, mindfulness practice, and it's not you, the parent, that would, like for my daughter, I encourage her to practice mindfulness. I try to make resources available for her to do it, and I try to model it. But it's not my—it's not me telling her or anything. Yeah. It's a, it's a skill. You can Google it. Uh, totally on your own. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, so um, it has helped me so much and brought me awareness of what I'm feeling, and I. I just, I feel like it's such a... So I, I love mindfulness. I love the um, Headspace app. Mm -hmm. I have that, and that's part of my morning routine that I make sure to There's do that. There's so many resources out there. Yes, there. yes, so many good apps and videos YouTube videos. And, and blogs and whatever we got. Yeah, so mindfulness is super super helpful i think sure. it goes a lot in what you're saying about being expressing curiosity about the emotion and i think about this being becoming like a, a curious observer of your emotions I think mindfulness exactly is about becoming a curious observer of the moment or whatever it is in life that you're doing you know and i also think that you can do it without telling your kids i'm going to teach you mindfulness like mm -hmm. you can actually when you go out and you look at the stars together you're practicing mindfulness you know, and like you're, you're not telling them I'm teaching you a meditative skill mm -hmm. for life, but like you're actually just doing it together, you know? And I think that, you know, that modeling, it's like, oh, yeah. it's not a thing that you can just model and what you're doing with this. My daughter actually, for some reason, does not associate mindfulness with therapy or help or, I don't know how that was, how that happened, but we managed to do it for, for like fun, for a yeah. different, groups or classes and things throughout the years and uh, she doesn't resist uh, like she does if you're trying to put her in therapy, to give her help and you know, all this other stuff that she's like, I don't want any part of that. Yeah. But for some reason she thinks it's, so I'm like. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness <laughs> for that. that. <laughs> and that's, and with all this, there's so many different tools and not every tool works for every situation, but you find what tools work for you and your people and yeah I think too with mindfulness it's kind of a it's such a people talk about it all the time and I, at school they talk about it and sorry every time I say school I point to you because you are the school <laughs> Shelly yeah, Warren school. okay Paul did you have a question a minute I ago I did well no I just had a comment around I, I don't have any teenagers but I, I have very very little kids and you were talking about like go home and talk about this new thing you learned and then it's like been unbelievably effective with my kids, and I imagine it might help a teenager if you just humanize yourself in front yeah. of your kid. I think it's like really important to remind them that you don't know what you're doing <laughs> with like something. I think it's okay to a know, lot of things, <laughs> to, but just you know to show them that it's okay to admit that you don't know everything. But the idea of uh, of, of of being humble and you know having humility around. You know, like, I, the other day, this thing happened to me, and I felt, like, so confused and so upset. And, like, just sharing with them that that kind of stuff happens to you all the time. Yeah, yeah. And so it seems like it was so refreshing for I have a four-year-old, but he's very, he's very precocious. And so, like, he's always just so interested in, like, so what did you do? You know, he's like, yeah. and he asked me stories about when I was a kid, like, what, what people mean to eat. You know, he's always asking me stories. And sometimes I have to make stuff up because he's, like, I have too many <laughs> curiosities. But it's... it's it's been so effective to share with him that I don't, I'm, you know, I'm a student too, and I, yeah. I don't know everything about everything. I'm just learning. You know, I think teenagers might love that if you tell them that you're not so smart or not so great, because that's what they try to tell you all the time.
<laughs> oh, just you wait, Paul. <laughs> it's so fun. Um, okay, any other questions? These are great questions. Any other questions that people... Um, okay, we just have a couple more. But, okay, so I just want to... So allowing... I'm going to just repeat this. Allowing your emotions is the secret sauce. And it's, it's so simple... And it is yet not easy to do because it takes if you we're all really good at avoiding and resisting and reacting to our emotions. We are professionals. We've done it for decades. So this is not something that I that don't expect that you're going to walk out of the room and like, OK, I've got this figured out. This is something that takes time and like just stopping and being like, OK, oh, that's fascinating. I just ate that whole pint of haagen -Dazs because I was really mad at my husband or whatever. Oh, okay, that's interesting. I was, I was trying to avoid that. And just check, a lot of times you won't notice it until after. And, um, but it's just, it can be so helpful and cause, it can save us from so many problems when we're trying to avoid our emotions. Um, and once again, just our bodies, the human body was designed it came with all the emotions, that feelings wheel, all those emotions are normal. It is not, our, our, I also think about this a lot. Our emotions are not problems to be solved. Emotions are a normal part of life. Obviously what I do with them, that matters, but we can, like we don't want to think of them as a problem. Unless if I'm hitting and screaming and doing all those things, I don't want to do those behaviors, but there's nothing wrong with being wrong, being mad. And I would often say to my kids, it's totally okay to be mad, but it's not okay to be rude to me. Like, you need to be safe. And just, and letting them, I think that's another gift with Ellen that you were asking about, how do we teach our kids this? Give them that space, let them have their emotions. When they come home from school, let them, and just again, emotions are not a problem to be solved. And neither are my kids or my husbands. Let people, Feel what they're feeling and let yourself feel it. Kathy. Oh, no. Oh, I thought you were. I have one. Uh huh. Um, uh, I wanted to say that, um, so I work with young children. Uh, that's kind of like my career. Um, I just, I think that sometimes people need to know that young children and everybody, human people, are really uh, smart at emotions. I mean, maybe they don't know, maybe they're, they, 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 there's a lot of reasons why you might not be aware of your emotions or what, but reading people's emotions, reading your, like, I work with one-year-olds and they may not know calculus, but they can tell when you're angry yeah. You can't even, you may, you may be really good at hiding it, but they sense that. And then I was trying to help my husband see that my daughter, she's autistic. She reads. It's a myth that autistic people don't sense or feel emotions mm -hmm. or understand or, or see it. She can just smell it. She just she knows when he's doing X, Y, or Z, or yeah. when he's he's worried that she's gonna blank. She just she can uh, it's just I mean, in the room and she absorbs it. I think sometimes people think of young children as um, maybe they're not aware, they're too young to understand what's going on. But when it comes to emotions, I believe that they are very uh, capable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And humans, we are experts at reading, yeah. reading each other's emotions. Sometimes we're not right, but the, a lot of times we're yeah, pretty good at. Yeah, I misinterpret. Yeah, I don't say that they're always right, but I mean just like um, can't really say, oh well, I was so angry and um, and upset and depressed. Well, that doesn't bother the baby, or you know. Yeah, it's definitely. Very, it's very real. Yeah. Definitely. Um, 
so let's see. And speaking of kids, I love thinking um, of my emotions like a, I don't know about your kids, but my kids, I, w I remember like I would be on the phone making dinner, maybe even nursing a baby all at the same time, multitasking, and a kid would come in, mom, 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 and you're just like, just a second, you just, you know, like you just keep ignoring them for a second, and then all of a sudden, after a bit, they're like, mom, and they're dumping their sippy cups, and they're stomping through the goldfish and throwing a fit, where is if in the beginning, if we would have, you know, if they're, they come in, they're like, mom, if you would have tapped them on the shoulder and they're like, look at what the picture I drew. And just like we, if we would acknowledge them in the beginning, they're not going to throw a fit and they're going to, then they're going to run off and play and do their thing. Maybe you never know with the kid, but our emotions are the same way. And they're not going to, I think of them as uh, like toddlers. If we don't process our negative emotions, they're going to come back. And they're going to throw a fit with goldfish and sippy cups and like toddlers do. So if we can just allow them, that makes a big difference. The other thing, um, I like to think of emotions at, when you're allowing an emotion, I think of it as like a wave on the ocean that it's going to come and go, or I guess I'm doing it backwards. <laughs> it's going to go back and forth. And I hate to tell you, if you process grief for however long it takes, you're not done with grief. It's going to come back at some point. So when it comes back, then you, pro you allow it again. And a lot of times people say, well, Chris, how long do I do this for? You do it for how long it takes. And a lot of times um, I was uh, processing something this morning. I was really resentful and my eyebrows were up, Amy Higgins. And, um, and I was like, oh, yeah, I can feel that resentment. And I went and just sat there for five minutes. And I just, I was thinking, I'm like, okay, what does this feel like in my body? And the visual that I came up with today, it felt like I had a life jacket on. And the buckle, it was like right here, I could feel it and it was just tight. And it was like, oh yeah, that, I'm feeling resentment and I can feel this tightness in my chest. I kind of opened up to it. And it was literally like the little band, the straps kind of loosened up. But this is something it's, and then I'm guessing I'm going to be resentful again and I just do it again. So this might be, you're going to, every time these emotions come up, when we don't allow them, what happens is we get, you're resentful and then your kid comes in and they're loud. So then you're irritated and then you are mad and you just keep layering all these emotions on top of each other and it turns into a big mess. I have lots of experience with this, layering my emotions. And if we can allow that initial emotion, and then, the, then that's gone, and then I just deal with the next one. It's so, it's, it's a lot easier to deal with life that way. But um, any other questions about emotions or comments or anything? I have no idea. It could be 1230. <laughs> it's almost 830. Okay. Um, so I just. I had a comment. Oh. It's just like when I also think of like emotions as um, what like they share information and they, and they help us to take appropriate action mm -hmm. if we pay attention to them and process them, right? So like yes. if you allow them, like I'm thinking of your resentment. <laughs> I'm like usually if I have recurring resentment, it means I need to set a boundary. You know, like there's something. Mm -hmm. that, there's a message in it. Yes, there's a message in it, and I feel like that's like the next step. So. Like, if I'm always angry, like that's also probably a boundary. And you just said, like there's something, yeah. something that I'm feeling violated by, you know, and, and like, and it's okay to address that. Yes. Rather than like avoid it and push it aside and stuff. So yeah. Like, I feel like also stopping and looking at what is the message of this emotion, you know, like why am I feeling this and what, what do I need to do? What goal do I need? You know, what behavior do I need to do in order to meet the goal of that emotion? Yes. And sometimes, like I talk to my emotions. Sometimes I'm like. Oh, hello, resentment. <laughs> Come on in. I recognize you. Come and sit down. And like, I'm serious that I'll do that. And so it's just like, instead of pushing, like, I'm not going to feel this. I'm going to go eat all the Hagen dazs It's like, I, yeah, come on in. Come and sit by me. And you can sit here as long as you need to. I might even carry you around in my bag today. And I'm going to walk around with resentment in my purse or whatever. And just like, 
to acknowledge that it's there. I was also going to say one of the tools that I think of is our emotions. I think of it as like a check engine light on your car. And right now I have one, a tire pressure one that keeps going beep, beep. And I'm like resisting you. <laughs> I know this is going to be expensive, but our emotions are doing that same. So what is the message? What is it trying to tell us? So it's important that we look into them. But okay, we told you we'd have you out of here at 830. So I better hurry. But um, and you guys, most of you, Christine, you're the only one that is not in my contacts on my phone. So maybe this is for you. <laughs> but um, so if I, pardon? <laughs> yes. So I've got, um, so my, I'm Chris Rich Coaching and I have a website, chrisrichcoaching.com. I am a life and a mixed faith marriage coach. So if you look at my website, you might think, oh, this is just for mixed faith marriages. I do help a lot of clients with that and I help I coach on any other topic. So don't let that steer you away. Um, got my email there. I am on Instagram, Facebook, and I also have a um, YouTube channel where I've got a bunch of videos that I just started posting about and they are i am speaking a lot of times to people in a mixed faith marriage but it applies to you as to anyone with a human brain the same things work and um i also wanted to say i just did a class i did a webinar on goal setting the other day and if you go to my website there is a little pop-up right now that you can you put your um your email in and it'll send you this webinar and I also have a every week I, I have an email that I send out it's mixed faith Fridays and once again it applies to they're just great coaching tips and tools that you can get on my email list and get that so any questions any other questions well thank you for your time and if you please please feel free to reach out if you have questions about any of this. And I also, I offer a free mini session to help you, like if there's something that you wanna work on and you're interested in working with me further, you can try out a session and see if it's something that you're interested in. And you can find about all that on my website or you can just ask me in person. <laughs> so, okay. You're welcome. Paul, do you want me to turn the time back?